Okay, good afternoon. So today we're going to um, we have a crash course on immune responses today, host defenses. This is funny because, you know, you can take a whole, a whole course on immunology, which a lot of you have, and I'm going to reduce it to one lecture today. Uh, obviously, I'm just going to give you an overview, and I want to emphasize some points that are important for virus infections. And we'll need this next time, because next time we're going to talk about how infections uh, result in pathology, immunopathology. So we've already talked a little bit about some of the intrinsic defenses that we have, like our skin, mucus, tears, low pH, surface cleansing, and so forth. And then there are some others which I call cell autonomous. They work in all cells. The, the cell just responds automatically. And Dr. Silverstein will talk more about these uh, at some point in terms of how viruses overcome them. And these include apoptosis, autophagy, and epigenetic silencing. So these are responses to virus infection that happen more or less independently of the cell. So we won't talk about these today. What I want to talk about are innate responses and adaptive. And we're going to spend most of our time on innate. We're just going to mention adaptive briefly enough so that you will have enough information to understand the rest of our course. The innate is the first line of defense, of immune defense. So I, I distinguish immune defenses from intrinsic, which are always on in every cell. And then, of course, the adaptive is tailored to the pathogen. The, immune, the innate system is not. So this is the way I view it. This is my view of the immune system. A couple of brick walls. That's really all you need. We have our intrinsic defenses, which are a barrier to most viruses. And if viruses can overcome them and infect some cells, then they encounter innate immunity. And uh, that stops most infections. So you know, this, the idea that we're surrounded by viruses, most of them are stopped at the level of innate immunity. But if the pathogen gets over innate immunity, then it, then it encounters acquired immunity. Uh, and then if it gets beyond that, then you're quite sick and you need, some, you, you need to see your doctor. Uh, so we'll look at some of these today and how they work. Here's another view of it, a little more complicated view. We have our pathogen. Uh, and it is initially looked at by pattern recognition receptors, which we'll talk about. May not be recognized, in which case there's no more response. It's not, maybe it's not a pathogen, but uh, it, often it is recognized by pattern re recognition receptors. And this results in the production of cytokines and the innate immune response. Uh, the innate response also has a cellular component. Dendritic cells are a major part of that. NK cells, macrophages. And we'll see how all those work together to try and stop infection. But if they can't, they go for help. So the innate system knows when to call for help. And these cells are the way that it does it. The cells and the chemicals, the cytokines, are the way it does that. It communicates with the adaptive response. And it admits defeat. It says, we can't handle this. We need to have your help and make some antibodies or cells. And so the adaptive response will evaluate the pathogen, and then make antibodies and T cells to deal with it. And of course, in the end, you'll have some memory. If you survive your infection, you have memory. So the next time you get infected with a similar pathogen, hopefully things will happen a lot quicker and you can respond and, and not even get infected. So let's start with the innate immune system. This is something that is always active in us. You don't have to have any prior exposure to virus. A virus particle comes in your upper tract the innate system is activated within a few minutes of this uh, virus getting into cells. Its components are cytokines, soluble mediators of its activity, and what we call sentinel cells. These are cells that patrol your entire body. They're always circulating in all your organs and tissues looking for trouble. Dendritic cells, macrophages, NK cells, and a few other kinds of cells that we're not going to talk about. And then finally, complement, a blood component, actually a pretty complicated series of proteins in the blood uh, that is really a link between innate and adaptive defenses. And as I said, I'm going to say this a couple of times in this lecture, when the infection reaches a certain point, it reaches a certain threshold, 
it, the innate system cannot handle it anymore, it will inform the adaptive system. And this usually happens when maybe more than a few cells are infected. If the innate system can't handle it, then it calls in uh, the adaptive. So how does the innate system recognize the pathogen? This was a real problem for a long time. We didn't understand how you could recognize self from non-self. How do you know that you're okay, most of what's in you are okay, but when a pathogen comes in, what do you do? So this starts in 1980 with people studying fruit flies over in Germany. And the whole field of innate immunity comes from fruit flies. And this is why when people say, why do we study flies and worms? This is why, because you never know what's going to happen. I don't know, maybe you remember a presidential candidate a number of years ago who questioned studying worms uh, and flies. Well, this is one reason. There are lots of other reasons, of course. Uh, Nusslein Volhard and Wieschaus were studying development in fruit flies. And they were doing something which was really unusual at the time. They were making mutations in the flies using various mutagens and then looking for mutants that had developmental defects. So this had never been done before. I mean, today it sounds like routine, but uh, they were particularly interested in the gene in involved in establishing this axis, the dorsal ventral axis. So they found a gene and uh, it, it, it affected this dorsal ventral axis. And the, the legend goes that when Christian Nusslein Varhard was looking at these flies under a microscope, they were so weird that she said, das war ja toll, which depending on your German means, you know, weird, this is really crazy or far out. And so they called them, they called them toll-like receptors. So that's the origin of toll. And eventually these toll-like receptors were found to have a role in fly immunity as well as in uh, the development of this axis. And in 1997, they were identified in mammals, and a couple of people got the Nobel Prize for this uh, very recently. So they just took the fly genes and said, are there similar genes in mammals? And there were, and now we have a whole field started by a gene in flies. So when your parents ask you, why should we study flies, now you can tell them, because you never know what's going to happen. So toll-like receptors is what we call them, TLRs. These are type 1 transmembrane proteins, and these are pattern recognition receptor molecules. They recognize what, what are called PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular pa patterns. Basically, they can tell the difference between you and a, a pathogen that's uh, infecting you. And they're quite conserved uh, through the phylogenetic tree, something like 13 different members. So there are a lot of them, and um, here are some of them. This is by no means an up-to-date up figure or table, but it gives you an idea what these look like. Again, they're transmembrane proteins. There are a bunch of them. You can see they're given different numbers from TLR1 and up. This is the original toll gene in Drosophila, by the way. And these proteins are made up of an intracellular domain. It's called the toll IL1 receptor or tier domain. Uh, and then the extracellular part is a series of leucine-rich repeats. And you can see from the structure of TLR3 here, each of these uh, subunits, if you will, is a leucine repeat. So it's a curved molecule made up of these subunits. In the picture here, the leucine repeat is shown as a little box. And some of the things these recognize are shown here, uh, for example, double-stranded RNA, flagellin, a bacterial component, CPG, DNA, uh, lipopolysaccharide, a viral glycoprotein, and there's some others here as well. So these are the first pattern recognition molecules to be discovered. They can tell when you are infected uh, with a pathogen. This is quite amazing. And the way they work is they recognize the molecule in some way, whether it be RNA or DNA or a protein. And the molecule, the foreign molecule, triggers a response. So here's an example of RNA being detected by a toll-like receptor. Again, the extracellular domain is this curved molecule made up of the leucine-rich repeats. And in this case, the idea is that when viral RNA is detected, these molecules dimerize, and the dimerization causes an activation of the intracellular domain, which then initiates a phosphorylation cascade, leading to the production of cytokines. So there's cytokines produced as a result of, of activation of these. So the details are not really important. What is important is that they recognize foreign molecules and result in the production of molecules that then have a subsequent effect. 
So these toll-like receptors can be on the plasma membrane, depending on the cell type. Many of them are in endosomes, as shown here. So remember, that a lot of viruses get in by the endocytic pathway. So a lot of the TLRs are in the endosome, because that's where the viral nucleic acid is often uh, found. And we have TLR3, for example, which recognizes double-stranded RNA. Now remember, double-stranded RNA re really isn't found in an uninfected cell, so this is a good signature uh, for a pathogen. Uh, these other single-stranded RNAs um, are typically not found in the endosome unless a pathogen is coming in. So that's in part where some of the specificity comes from. Now what happens here is that these TLRs bind the signature molecule, whatever it is, and as I said, there's dimerization, and then initiation of phosphorylation cascades. There are a variety of them. The point is that in the end, they result in uh, activation of transcription factors. Uh, these are called IRFs, or interferon regulatory factors. They go into the nucleus and stimulate the production of antiviral proteins. And these include uh, cytokines, such as TNF-alpha, IL-6, and IL-12, and also the interferons, which in turn have uh, their own induction pathway that we'll talk about. All right, so that's one class of signature molecules. You can also see that in the cytoplasm, there are also some sensors. This is another class of sensor molecules in addition to the TLRs. And these are called the rigi-like helicases. Uh, rigi is an example. There's another one called MDA5. These are proteins in the cytoplasm. And they detect viral RNA there. And they also, when they detect viral RNA, become activated and lead to a signaling pathway that results in the production of cytokines uh, in the nucleus. Cytokine mRNAs in the nucleus, which the mRNAs, of course, then go out into the cytoplasm and get translated. So two general types of uh, sensors, toll-like receptors, membrane-bound toll-like receptors, soluble cytoplasmic. These are helicases, in fact, and so they're called rigi-like uh, helicases. So here's another description of the rigi pathway. Uh, these molecules, rigi or MDA5, they detect um, RNAs that are not normally in the cell. And among these are uh, double-stranded RNAs. So MDA5 detects um, double-stranded RNAs. And RIGI also does. RIGI detects double-stranded RNAs with a 5' phosphate. So normally in the cell, you don't see RNAs with 5' phosphates. They're either capped or they're in the nucleus. So this is a good signature for detecting uh, foreign RNAs. So here on the left is the general pathway, rig I or MDA5, detecting viral RNAs. When they do bind viral RNAs, they become activated. Um, and they interact with a mitochondrial protein, uh, which goes by many names. It could be MAVS, as shown here. Another nice name is Visa. It's always with you, or something like that, right? Uh, and then when, when rig I or MDA5 bind MAVs, then that is initiates a phosphorylation cascade. And none of this I would ever ask you to know, so don't worry about it. I just want you to know that detection of foreign RNA leads to the production of cytokines in the nucleus. And I just want you to see how that happens so it's not a black box. There are a variety of phosphorylation cascades that lead to the phosphorylation of transcription proteins. They dimerize, they go in the nucleus, and sit down on promoters of various genes. In this case, we're looking at the production of interferon beta uh, mRNA. And interferon beta and alpha and other interferons, as you will see, are, are the proteins that then coordinate the uh, antiviral defense. In case you're wondering how RNA uh, activates these molecules, here on the right is a model for how this works. Uh, rig I, which is normally in the cytoplasm at low levels, uh, is normally inactive. When it detects, when it binds to viral RNA, the molecule is unfolded. And this domain here called the card domain is, is exposed, as you can see here, when it binds RNA. And that card domain is what in, interacts with MAVs or, or VISA on the mitochondrion. Uh, and then the idea is that many rig I molecules uh, interact on MAVs, and that starts the signaling cascade. Uh, and that's what's being identified here. But the key here, again, is simply that these sensors can detect RNA as foreign by virtue of 5' phosphates or double-stranded character. And when they detect it, the cell makes 
interfere on. Now, just in the last couple of weeks, a sensor for DNA has been discovered. This is really interesting. There were two back-to-back -back papers in Cell just a couple of weeks ago. Now, I've told you mainly about sensing RNA. Some of the TLRs sense DNA. But the, a sensor for DNA has, has always been evasive. Um, and here is shown the sensor as a protein called C-gas, cyclic GAMP synthetase. And this is an enzyme in the cell that takes ATP and GTP and joins them into a cyclic molecule. It's shown up here. So A and G join together in this cyclic uh, configuration. So that's what cyclic GAMP is. So this is produced when C-gas detects viral DNA, apparently. So C-gas is the sensor for DNA in the cytoplasm. So DNA binds C-gas, cyclic GAMP gets produced, and then cyclic GAMP, this little molecule here, binds another protein in the cytoplasm called sting, which then starts a phosphorylation cascade, just like the ones I've told you about, leads to phosphorylation of transcription proteins, which then go into the nucleus and induce the synthesis of cytokines, including interferons. So this is really an interesting pathway, and if any of you have studied physiology, you know that uh, cyclic AMP is a well-known second messenger, which is very much like this. This is composed only of A, and this is cyclic GAMP. So another example of, this was just totally brand new discovery. A couple, nobody even knew that this compound or this enzyme actually existed in cells. But it follows a paradigm established by uh, cyclic AMP, which is, of course, a second messenger that responds to many kinds of extracellular stimuli. The only thing that I wonder about here is when is viral DNA in the cytoplasm? And I can't really think of a time when it's there because most of the time these DNA viruses go to the nucleus, right? So when is viral DNA going to get into the cytoplasm? I mean, they show it being here and they show it coming out of the nucleus, but as far as I know, that is not a part of any viral life cycle. I mean, pox viruses replicate in the cytoplasm but they are contained in a nice enclosed factory. So while this work is beautiful and clearly shows, for example, if you knock down the C-gas protein and you infect with herpes simplex, the cells don't make interferon. So clearly something is happening. But I don't understand why these viruses put DNA in the cytoplasm. Everything I've told you so far is that they go in the nucleus. Anyway, it's a really cool new sensor uh, for DNA. Now, all of these sensing pathways, the TLRs, the RIGI-like receptors, uh, cyclic C-gas, uh, all of these lead to the production of interferons, which are the proteins that then do all the work in the innate system. So interferons were discovered in the 50s. These investigators found that when they infected chicken cells with, in with influenza virus and they took the supernatant and treated new cells with the supernatant, they were protected from infection. So they called it interferon because something in the cell culture interfered with virus infection. And later on that was uh, shown to be a distinct set of proteins. Uh, there, are two, there are several interferons. Two of them are shown here, interferon alpha and beta. Uh, these are the earliest produced. So these are cytokines. These are produced very uh, early after infection. And then there's another interferon gamma uh, which is produced later. Virus infected cells make interferons. So for example, we have our mucosal epithelium in the respiratory tract or in the gut. If virus is coming in here, these cells get infected, they make interferon. And that interferon is produced in order to try and prevent other cells from getting infected. Now in addition to the infected cells producing interferon, they produce other cytokines as well, and they attract sentinels. Remember the sentinels, the dendritic cells, the macrophages, and et cetera, those dendritic cells will sense that there, is, there are cytokines being produced in that initially infected mucosal epithelium. They will come there. They're always circulating, but when they sniff a little cytokine, they home in there, and they will start to crank out even more interferons themselves. And they do other things as well, as you will see. So they sniff the cytokines that are produced. But then as these cells break, as virus destroys them, uh, those cells are breaking open, they're releasing viruses, they're releasing nucleic acids, the sentinels will pick up those products 
they will endocytose them and say, hmm, these are foreign, because they have all these detection receptors as well. And there are three different ki four different kinds of interferons, alpha, beta, gamma, and lambda. Um, alpha and beta are produced by probably all cells and induced by virus infection. Uh, gamma is more restricted to T cells and NK cells. And interferon lambda is a pretty recently described interferon produced uh, by epithelial cells. Now interferons, as I said, the initial ones are produced very quickly. They go up really quickly and then they go down. As you will see, interferon is not always a good thing. When you feel lousy when you have an infection, you can blame interferon very early on. Uh, these proteins, interferon, alpha, beta, and the others, what they do is they <coughs> bind to receptors on the cell surface. There are interferon receptors on all of our cells. Interferon binds to them. In, and then turns on a signaling pathway, which results in more mRNA synthesis in the nucleus. This time, uh, the, the mRNAs produce encode the so-called interferon-stimulated genes, ISGs. So we'll be using this term a lot. Interferon induces the transcription of the ISG mRNAs, and then, of course, they eventually get translated in the cytoplasm. There are over a thousand ISGs, and so. They must be different for different viruses. They must be different depending on the tissue that we're talking about because you don't need over 1,000 to inhibit uh, influenza virus. You only need a few, as it turns out. Most of them, we don't understand how they work, just a handful. And in fact, only recently have people begun to develop assays to figure out um, which ones are inhibiting which viruses. And in the end, it's probably their combinations that are specific for different viruses. And so, for example, people who get very serious influenza, we'll talk more about flu later, but <clears throat> there are some people when, you get, when they get infected with flu, develop very serious lung disease, they may die, much more serious than the rest of the population is. So studies of these individuals have shown that some of them have mutations in a very specific ISG. So this one is very important for controlling flu, and these individuals, some of them who get serious flu, have a mutation in that gene. So this is how the interferon pathway works. Again, I don't want you to memorize this pathway. There's no point. I want you to know the principle that interferon produced in response to sensing by TLRs, RLRs, uh, the CGAMP, CGAS DNA sensor, re results in the production of interferons. They bind interferon receptors on the cell surface, and that initiates a phosphorylation cascade that is there are, there are kinases that phosphorylate another set of proteins and so, far, and so on until you get to the point of having transcription proteins phosphorylated, they dimerize, go in the nucleus, and stimulate the production of ISG mRNAs. So it's a multi-step process, probably to allow uh, regulation and control. And let's look at a couple of these ISGs. We talked about one a couple of sessions ago, PKR protein kinase R. It's the double-stranded RNA activated protein kinase. Remember, PKR is induced by interferon when viruses infect the cell. Uh, it's activated then by double-stranded RNA, which is produced by virus infection. And its target is EIF2 alpha. It phosphorylates EIF2 alpha to shut down translation. So this is a global effect on the cell. The cell wants to shut everything down so the virus can't spread. And this is a good way to do it. And as I told you last time, viruses have to overcome this. They have to have an antagonist of um, EIF2 alpha phosphorylation. So this, is, this is, has broad effects. It will inhibit many different viruses because they all need to translate, of course. This also triggers autophagy, autophagy the phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha, programmed cell death. So many viruses have to overcome that. And EIF2 alpha P also stimulates the production of stress granules and P bodies, those places where mRNAs are put in to, to silence them. So this is a very powerful effect, just putting a phosphate on this molecule. Another ISG is, well, there are two of them here, RNAs L and 2 prime, 2 prime, 5 prime oligo A synthetase. Now, uh, what happens here is that, again, interferon induces the synthesis of these mRNAs. The protein translated first is 2 prime, 5 prime OAS. It's inactive. 
it gets activated by the presence of double-stranded RNA, again, which is a viral signature. Once OAS is activated, it takes ATP and makes a very strange oligo A, okay, 12 to 15 long, with a very strange 2 to 5 prime bond, instead of your typical 5 to 3 prime bond. And this, in turn, activates another ISG protein called RNA cell. So both 2 prime, 5 prime OAS and RNA cell are made inactive. OAS is activated by viral RNA. RNA cell is then activated by the oligo A produced by this enzyme. Now have active RNA cell. This degrades the RNAs in the cytoplasm. And it, it doesn't have much distinction between cellular mRNA and viral RNA. The, again, the idea here is to shut down viral translation. If you degrade uh, the viral mRNAs, they can't make proteins. Many viruses have ways to get around this. They can inhibit various parts of this pathway. Nitric oxide synthase. This is an enzyme that takes arginine and makes nitric oxide from it. It's an interferon-induced enzyme. Now, why would you want to make nitric oxide? Well, nitric oxide is quite reactive. It reacts with proteins and nitrates them, and that inactivates the protein. Uh, or it can be combined with oxygen to, to form an even more reactive molecule called peroxynitrite. And these have antiviral effects. So for example, here we have a infected epithelium, a monolayer in, in a body somewhere, virus is being produced. Uh, among the, so cells are coming in here, macrophages perhaps, uh, and they sense the infection and they produce uh, nitric oxide synthase and the result is the production of nitrates and peroxynitrites. And these basically damage the cells and kill them. And then they can't make any more viruses. So it stops infection, but of course you get tissue damage. And this is part of what I said a long time ago. A lot of the pathology of a virus infection is caused by the immune response. That's what this is. So in, in animal models, if you inhibit this enzyme, you actually get less pathology from certain viral infections. Uh, PML proteins are also interesting ISGs. Dr. Silverstein will tell you more about these. Promyelocytic proteins, these are present in the nucleus in very specific bodies called, they have a lot of names, PML bodies, ND10s, pods. But basically what these do is they bind DNA and they repress it transcriptionally. They remodel the nucleosomes, they probably have effects on histone acetylation levels. Uh, and they basically inhibit viruses who have to transcribe mRNAs in the nucleus from DNA templates. And a lot of viruses, as you will guess, overcome this as well. And Dr. Silverstein will tell you more about that. Here's an interesting ISG recently discovered. It's called tetherin. It's a very strange protein. Uh, this protein is shown here as a coiled line. And the, that's the topology of the protein uh, in the plasma membrane. It crosses, the N-terminus is in the cytoplasm, it crosses the me membrane, and then it remains quite close to the membrane, and then its C-terminus is linked by a GPI uh, anchor. And what this does is the name sort of suggests it tethers newly budded viruses to the cell surface so they can't get off. So here's a diagram of that. You remember last time we talked about how uh, envelope viruses are produced by budding. Some of this can happen at the plasma membrane. Well, you know, these viruses have to float away, but tetherin grabs them. Uh, this part of the molecule coiled coil, which is not shown well in this illustration, grabs the virion and keeps them at the cell surface, and eventually they get endocytosed and degraded. So the virus can never spread. Now, of course, if tetherin were so effective, it would stop all infections. It is very effective, but viruses have evolved to overcome it. It's easy to overcome a single protein like this. In fact, the envelope protein of HIV-2 uh, and a, another protein of HIV-1 called VPU, the Ebola virus glycoprotein, all of these antagonize tetherin. They neutralize its ability to bind virus so that their virions can be uh, shed into the cell supernatant. So an interesting idea, but viruses can get around it. So the interferon system is, is in fact, dangerous. Uh, it induces a lot of gene products, which um, 
have, have various effects. And just a few of them I've told you, nitric oxide, for example, can be quite toxic. And this is why you have fever, chills, nausea, and malaise after almost every virus infection. That's what people call a flu-like syndrome, but in fact it's caused uh, by interferon being produced. Because even though you may have a respiratory infection, the virus is in, say, your <coughs> upper tract, the interferons are produced and they get into your circulation, they go everywhere, and they can have effects, systemic effects on you, because there's no way to limit them. And that's why you get these symptoms very early on in a viral infection. And every infection results in interferon production. And that's uh, where this flu-like symptom name has come from. And of course, they're not all caused by flu. It just, happened to be, it just happens that flu causes a very marked induction of interferon. So that's where the name first came from. As I said, there are also cellular components of the innate immune response, and these include uh, dendritic cells, which are shown on the left here. These have very characteristic morphology. If you didn't know, you might say they, they, they were uh, neural cells, but they are cells with a cell body and very long processes. Um, also, natural killer cells, which are shown here. Those are the yellow guys attacking an infected cell and macrophages, which aren't show, shown here. So these are sentinels, they patrol. As you are sitting there now, these are circulating throughout every part of you. And they're looking, you can't feel them, obviously, you don't know they're doing this, but they are protecting you. If you get an infection, they're gonna home there and, and sense it. Now, dendritic cells were discovered a long time ago. They were called Langerhans cells by this investigator. But in 1973, uh, Ralph Steinman, shown here, working at the Rockefeller University, really figured out what they were doing, and he called them dendritic cells because of the way they look. They look like they have dendrites, which are on neural cells, of course. And he just died not too long ago. I don't know if you know the story, but uh, he, uh, he was given the Nobel Prize uh, just a couple of years ago, but he had already died, and the Nobel Committee didn't know it. They called his home and say, so you, you know, Dr. Steinman, you have, you have the Nobel Prize, but he had died. So they were worried that they would take it away because you can't get the prize posthumously. But since they didn't know he had died, they decided that he could keep it. So he got the Nobel Prize, and we talked about this uh, on a podcast not too long ago. So those are, those are dendritic cells. Now, see, so here's a neat picture of a dendritic cell. It's labeled with green fluorescence. And this dendritic cell is talking to T cells, which are labeled blue in this picture. And you can see they're right by a blood vessel. That's the red here. And that's what these, these guys do. These are communicators. So again, dendritic cells are in your periphery. They're circulating, looking for trouble. They have toll-like receptors. They have rigi-like helicases. They have cytokine receptors. They probably have sea gas in the cytoplasm. I don't know if anyone's looked yet. And they are called immature. But when they encounter cytokines and antigen, they mature, they go to the lymph nodes, which are always nearby, no matter where they are, and they say to the T cells and the B cells in the lymph nodes, I think we have a problem, and they show them antigens that they've picked up, and then the T cells will respond if they're in fact foreign. So these cells are really the ones that take it beyond the, the innate response. They, if the infection is going out of control and the innate response can't control it, these guys will go to the lymph nodes and start to activate the, uh, the adaptive response, the production of antibodies and T cells. And these cells, as I said, also at the site of infection, they will produce interferon. Uh, so they'll go to your, to your mucosal monolayer that's infected. They will go there because they're sensing the cytokines produced. They will produce a ton of interferon. If that doesn't wipe out the infection, then they go to the lymph nodes and present the antigens that they've picked up. It's a very cool system. So here are your dendritic cells. This is a mature one, which is what was in that photograph a couple of slides ago. It looks like a dendrite. Um, but on the left is how they look when they're circulating in your peripheral tissues. They are immature. They look like pretty much every other cell, except that they have a lot of uh, armamentarium, if you will. They have toll-like receptors. They uh, have cytokine receptors. They have MHC molecules ready to be loaded and presented on the cell surface. 
they can make interferon and they will they are actively taking up stuff from the medium they're very phagocytic they can take up viruses or viral proteins they can of course detect cytokines and they can take up dead and dying cells so they can really respond to damage that's going on uh, in an infected area when they sense all this stuff then they become activated their morphology transforms they put MHC on their surface and if they've taken up viral proteins those get digested and presented in the MHC molecules and that's how they present them to T and B cells right they go in the lymph node they find here a T cell for example and they're engaging this T cell they're saying look I have this peptide I think it's an issue uh, if it is you better start dividing and proliferating and the um, uh, dendritic cell is also producing cytokines that help to activate the T cell now if this antigen is not a problem none of this activation occurs none of the T cell proliferation will, will occur but um, if it's a viral protein and the, and the T cells can tell because there are T cells that are specific for all of these antigens uh, then you will get proliferation and uh, production of all kinds of T cells as well as B cells so this can happen with B cells as well to make antibodies now DCs can also be Trojan horses they can unwittingly carry viruses into the lymph node uh, they can be so there's a protein on their surface called DC sign and HIV will bind to this it doesn't infect them very well although it can infect DCs HIV 1 can infect DCs but what it does is binds this DC protein and the, the DCs go into the lymph node as part of their normal circulation and they bring the virus with them and what kind of cells does HIV want to replicate in T cells which are of course in great abundance uh, in the lymph node as well as in the circulation but this is a really sneaky way of getting to where your host cells are Trojan horse um, other viruses can do it as well Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus dengue viruses they both replicate in dendritic cells and of course the dendritic cells are infected they go to the lymph node remember to present the antigens to the T cells and they end up spreading uh, the infection in there as well now people are wondering if this is a good vaccine strategy if you make an attenuated virus that is one that doesn't cause disease maybe you can have the virus go into the lymph node via the DCs because then once you're in there the DCs will present it say to B cells and you get a really good antibody response so that could be an interesting vaccine strategy that people are exploring but the viruses that do infect DCs mess them up so HIV infects a small fraction of DCs it totally interferes with their maturation so an HIV infected DC that is one in which the virus has gotten in and is replicating doesn't mature it stays in an immature state it doesn't migrate well so there are lots of consequences this is one of the reasons why HIV infection is so bad it infects immune cells like this and really really interferes uh, with their functions okay so we've those that's a brief overview of the um, sentinel cells if you will let's talk a little bit about complement complement is a quite an old discovery uh, identified 1890 as something in serum that helped antibodies to lyse bacteria so that's why it was called complement because it complemented the activity of antibodies if you certain antibodies against bacteria when added to them will lyse the bacteria and the complement made that lysis even better this is a major link between uh, innate and adaptive systems complement is always present circulating in our blood so it can respond very quickly but it will also work with the adaptive system it works with antibodies as you'll see now complement is a whole bunch of serum proteins and membrane proteins and they can recognize foreign also very much like TLRs and RLRs they can recognize foreign patterns in bacteria and other pathogens uh, and they also help to uh, let antibodies recognize the pathogen so this can work early and late uh, in infection complement can do four things it can help lyse cells so if you have a virus infected cell it can aid in, in lysing them it can help cause inflammation we haven't introduced this term yet but inflammation is the whole sum of effects that happen when cytokines are produced locally we'll talk about 
that in a moment. So they can induce the production of cytokines very, very much like uh, other sensors can, the RLRs and the TLRs and so forth. So they can make inflammation. They can cause opsonization. Complement can coat uh, virus particles. It can coat bacteria to make it easier for a macrophage to recognize it and take it up and destroy it. And finally, it can dissolve immune complexes. Uh, when you have a vigorous antibody response against the pathogen, often you get lots of antibody antigen complexes, so antibody virus complexes. These tend to be very large and in the very, very smallest capillaries in our body, in our brains and in our kidneys, these can clog the capillaries and cause um, a variety of immunopathologies. And co complement can help. It can help dissolve these complexes when they're causing this kind of blockage, because the blockage causes inflammation, and that recruits the complement to try and get rid of this. So here is a simplified view of some of the things that uh, complement can do. Uh, <coughs> the main detector is called C1Q, and that's, that's this funny-looking molecule here. C1Q can detect something as foreign. It can detect, it can bind to cell surfaces, to, vir to cell surfaces that have been altered by say virus infection, there are new antigens on the cell surface, C12 can detect that. Sometimes antibodies are binding to viral antigens on cell surfaces, so complement can bind to those as well. So it recognizes something about the cell that's foreign. This is just the cell here, it also can do similar things uh, with vi viruses. Once the C1Q is bound and it's multimerized, as you can see here, it then triggers a series of conversions. For example, it converts uh, this molecule called C4 and C2 into a, another molecule which binds the cell surface. There are a series of chain reactions that occur, and the endpoint is the formation of this pore. All these are complement protein components. And in the end, you get this pore form, punches a hole in the infected cell, it's trying to destroy it, very much like a T cell would, would uh, destroy an infected cell. So that's lysis, cytolysis of the cell. Some of these other proteins we have labeled here as mediators of inflammation. So some of the cleavage products made from this cascade, they can recruit inflammatory cells like the, cyto like the sentinels, like macrophages, who will make more cytokines in the infected area. So the complement cascade has lots of features of other aspects of the innate response, but as you can see, can also interact uh, with the adaptive response in the form of antibodies. So this is really a simplified view of what is going on, but it gives you an idea of how, how effective the complement system is. Now let's talk about the inflammatory response. This is an important concept for you to get. What is inflammation? So we've already talked about how in early stages of infection, the, the infection is detected and cytokines are produced either by the infected cell or by the sentinels that have come by and detected it. They make cytokines themselves. And one of the earliest cytokines produced is TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha. And that also other, together with other cytokines causes inflammation. And what is inflammation? Heat, redness, pain, heat, and swelling. These are the four classic signs of inflammation. They're so classic that the Roman encyclopedist Celsus knew about it way back then. He called it rubor, dolor, calor, and tumor. So this, people have known about this for a long time, but of course only in modern times do we understand the molecular basis. The cytokines caused increased blood flow. They make the capillaries permeable. They cause an influx of phagocytic cells, and they cause tissue damage. And that's why you get redness, pain, heat, and swelling. In any area that's infected with a virus or any other pathogen, you're causing inflammation as a result of the early responses, TNF-alpha and other cytokines, and they have these effects. So this is, uh, these are signs of infection, but it's actually good, as you will see in a moment. Inflammation is good. So here's a, a sort of cartoon of, to summarize what we've talked about so far. We have an area in your body which is infected 
and it's producing viral antigens, let's say. That's this area uh, right in here. So the infection is going to result in the production of cytokines. It's going to recruit dendritic cells to that area. Uh, these DCs will produce more cytokines. They're going to eventually go back into the lymph circulation and reach a lymph node uh, and instruct T cells and B cells to start maturing and proliferating. Those will eventually make antibodies. And the T cells, of course, will kill virus infected cells. Um, the complement pathway is going to result in the production of more cytokines, which can attract uh, phagocytic cells and other kinds of uh, inflammatory cells. At the same time, uh, cells are being recruited from the circulation, which is shown here. So here's a, a phagocytic cell coming through the wall. It's attracted by all the cytokines that are produced in this infected area. Uh, TNF-alpha interferon gamma and IL-1, some of the cytokines produced here, permeabilize the walls of the blood vessel. And that's one of the symptoms, of the signs of inflammation, of course, the permeability and the leakage of fluids into the circulation, into the tissue. So the, you can see early on in infection, you have the classic signs of an inflammation, which are caused uh, by all these immune and adaptive components responding. Uh, there are a lot of different cytokines, and we div divide them into three groups. There are pro-inflammatory cytokines, which include the tumor necrosis factors, which is one of the main causes of those signs of inflammation. Um, there are anti-inflammatory cytokines because you can't, you can't have unregulated pro-inflammatory cytokines. You have to dampen their activity because they cannot be there all the time. Uh, and then there are chemokines that help to recruit various immune cells in the immune response. Now remember, no matter where these, the infection is, let's say you have an infection in the respiratory tract, you have systemic effects. So the, the cytokines that are produced get into the circulation, the lymph and the blood circulation, they go everywhere. So for example, you feel tired, sleepy, you get fever as a result of an infection in your respiratory tract because some of the cytokines induce that. Um, they also have effects in your liver as well. Uh, they also go into your bone marrow and induce proliferation of hematopoietic precursors. You're gonna need more macrophages and lymphocytes in your blood. And these cytokines, these colony stimulating factors, again, produced in response to infection will do that. So you have global effects. That's why when you get influenza, you just feel completely lousy all over. It's not just your respiratory tract, but it's everywhere because these cytokines and other molecules enter your circulation and infect other uh, tissues as well. By the way, fever is a common response to certain cytokines and we really don't understand to this day why fever is induced. What's, what's the function of it? Inflammation is good. It stimulates potent immune responses. Now, cytopathic viruses are the ones that kill your cells, right? They get in, they infect very quickly, and they break them, and the cells break open. So you get lots of tissue damage. This is good because the DCs, the dendritic cells, come along and they pick up all this damage and debris from the cells, and they bring it into the lymph node and get the uh, um, adaptive response going. So inflammation is good. It shows you that you're having a good immune response to virus infection. And it, cytopathic viruses are good at it because they make a lot of junk from uh, destroyed cells. These uh, cytopathic viruses like adenoviruses and herpes and pox viruses, they all have in their genome gene products, and Dr. Silverstein will tell you about some of these, gene products that modulate the inflammatory response. They have antagonists for, say, TNF-alpha. They don't want you to make a good immune response, so they try and interfere at the very uh, earliest stages. So again, you, in every genome of these large viruses, you see antagonists of inflammation. So they can't stop destroying cells, these viruses. That's part of their life cycle, but they can interfere with the cell's immune response. Now, there are a number of viruses that don't overtly kill cells, and we call these non-cytopathic viruses. And in the, in the lab, you can infect a culture of cells with them, and the cells will look perfectly healthy. They will be producing viruses, but the cells are not damaged. 
so they don't stimulate the inflammatory response very well because there's nothing coming out of the dead and dying cells to be picked up by the dendritic cells, for example. So these are what we call non-cytopathic viruses. They don't damage cells, the cells don't die, so there is a very low or ineffective in, innate or inflammatory response. And these viruses have a really a different way of interacting with our immune systems. They can cause persistent infections. They infect you and they go on for a long period of time because you're not getting a good inflammatory response going. And so this is one mechanism by which these viruses have evolved to be with us for long periods of time by keeping the cell damage very low so that inflammation is low as well. So you see inflammation is good in terms of an immune response. It gets the innate and adaptive responses going and talking and if you don't have inflammation you don't have a good immune response and you don't clear the infection. So inflammation it's good it's the communication between the innate and the adaptive responses and if you don't have an infl a good inflammatory response you don't have a good adaptive response again you don't have good antibodies and t-cells produced and the infection is not efficiently cleared. And this is one reason we use adjuvants in vaccines. Many vaccines do not replicate. If a vaccine doesn't replicate, it cannot cause good inflammation because cells are not dying and releasing products that would be taken up by dendritic cells. So we add an adjuvant. It's, it's a compound that in itself stimulates inflammation. It's been empirically discovered to be able to do that, to be able to stimulate cells to produce all these cytokines that would normally not produce unless cells are dying. <clears throat> so that's why we use adjuvants uh, in vaccines. So here's another overview of this. Um, just to put this all together, here we have our epithelial <coughs> monolayer being infected with our viruses. A few cells get infected. These infected cells produce cytokines. Those are the red dots. Remember, they're sensed by the innate immune system. Those cells produce cytokines. It attracts dendritic cells. The dendritic cells pour out interferon. If they can't stop infection, if the cells die, then the dendritic cells will pick up the remnants of the dead and dying cells, go into the lymph node, and there they will say to the T cells and B cells, tell me if this is foreign or not. And if it is, the T and B cells proliferate, and that leads to the production of antibodies and cytotoxic T cells, which go in the circulation and eventually make their way back uh, to the infected area. So that's kind of an overview of this whole process. And again, inflammation is having um, a good dendritic cell stimulation by having cell death and cytokine production. So if, if, again, if a virus is not cytopathic, it's not very good at this, and the dendritic cells really don't end up communicating well with the adaptive response. <clears throat> so that's our innate system, cytokines, pattern detectors, and the sentinels together with complement, all right? And again, the idea is it will stop an infection before you actually feel anything. And most of the viruses that are coming into your respiratory tract, they are stopped by the innate system. And you really don't know it if they're stopped early enough on before a lot of interferon is poured into your circulation. But if the infection gets beyond what the DCs and interferon can handle, then we go to the adaptive system. And I just want to really quickly go through that because we don't have a lot of time uh, to go in detail. But I do want to talk about why it's important for virus infections. If you want to get rid of an infection, if you want to clear it, make, eradicate the infection from your body, in most cases you need a good adaptive response. There are some exceptions, but by and large you need to have antibodies and T cells produced. So here are the effectors of the adaptive response. We have our uh, antigens, and here of course in this course we're interested in the viruses. Uh, and these are, remember, brought to the lymph nodes where fragments of viruses are brought to the lymph nodes by dendritic cells. So I've stuck in a dendritic cell here just to remind you that the DC is really crucial for bringing these antigens to the lymph nodes where they can then stimulate the adaptive response. 
So those D cells talk to B sorry, those DCs talk to both B cells and T cells. So on the left, uh, the DCs have brought antigen to B cells. And in the lymph node, the, the dendritic cell will select the right B cell clone that matches the viral peptide being displayed in the MHC molecule on the DC. And that particular clone of B cells will start to amplify. It will eventually become a plasma cell and secrete antibodies. So it's initially selected by virtue of antibody on its surface by the DC, and then eventually those antibodies will be made. And those antibodies then have antiviral properties, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. In the lymph node, the DCs also talk to T cells. And T cells uh, begin as, as naive precursors. There are two lines of T cells. They're CD4s and CD8s. And the CD8s will eventually become what we call cytotoxic T cells, and these will lyse virus-infected cells. And it will identify the virus-infected cell by virtue of the MHC molecules displaying a viral peptide. And Dr. Silverstein will go into this a little bit more because he's going to talk about how viruses antagonize this kind of presentation because obviously a virus-infected cell does not want to be killed by a CTL. So a dendritic cell going into the lymph node can stimulate the proliferation of this line of T cells. On the other hand, um, it can also stimulate the production of CD4 cells. And CD4 cells typically are making various cytokines. That's their main function. Uh, those cytokines help in B cell maturation, and they also help in maturation of CD8s. And actually, this is quite an important distinction, whether uh, the, the uh, infection is biased one way or the other can actually be determined by how the dendritic cells interact initially in the lymph node. So the outcome is, again, the DCs go in the lymph node, you have antibodies and cytotoxic T cells produced. Now antibodies uh, do what we call neutralize virus infection. They bind to the particle and prevent it from infecting. So in your blood, if a virus is spreading in the blood, the, the antibodies will combine with the virus. And remember, these have been selected in the lymph node, and then they make their way into the circulation. They bind virus particles and prevent them from infecting cells. We also make antibodies at our mucosal surfaces, in our respiratory tract, in our gut. We make a type of antibody called IgA, which is secreted. And this is also important for preventing infection at those surfaces as well. So for those viruses that get in that way, and as you know, there are many that enter by a mucosal roots, IgA is important for those as well. So in, we're talking here largely about helping prevent infection. That's how vaccines work. They induce antibodies, and we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. But some also help you to recover from infection. Uh, in general, we used to think that cytotoxic T cells were the most important effector for recovery uh, from virus infection. But we now know that for some, you need antibodies uh, also. So let me show you some experiments. This is an example of how antibody can prevent infection. So this is an experiment where monkeys were in injected with polio virus, uh, and then the percent paralysis is shown here. Uh, in the control group, you just infect, you infect them with polio virus, 100% of the monkeys get paralyzed. Then you've given other groups increasing amounts of antibody. So you have another animal that has recovered from infection. You take the serum from that animal, which has antibodies to polio, and now you inject those into these monkeys. So you see, uh, with increasing amounts of antibodies injected into these animals, you protect them uh, from infection. So this is called passive protection. You're giving preformed antibodies. But the idea is, if, this were, if these were vaccinated monkeys, they would be making an antibody response which would protect them uh, from infection. And um, this is one of the things you get if you're bitten by a rabid animal. They will immediately inject anti-rabies virus antibodies into the site of the animal bite to try and uh, neutralize the virus there. You're also immunized because you have a lot of time uh, before the virus reaches your CNS. Now, how do antibodies block infection? So I use the word neutralization. 
that's the same thing as blocking infection. If you add antibodies to a virus and the virus cannot infect, you, you are said to neutralize infectivity. So on the left is, is the pathway of entry of a virus by endocytic roots. It binds a receptor. It's taken up into endocytosis. And in this case, uh, the drop in pH leads to RNA release. Well, antibodies can interfere at many of these steps. There are some, and those are shown on the right here. Sometimes the antibodies will block the attachment site on the virus for the cell receptor. So the virus bound to antibodies can't attach, so it can't uh, infect. Sometimes the antibodies lead to aggregation. So you have antibody molecules binding multiple virions. So you make a big clump of viruses, and these are not very good at, at getting into cells. Uh, sometimes the antibodies block endocytosis. So they're bound to the virus. The virus binds its receptor, but can't be taken up into the cell. And even more beyond that, there are antibodies that will come into the endocytic pathway with the virus. And when the pH drops, the genome is not released. So the antibodies apparently are locking the capsid into a conformation such that low pH doesn't alter it to get the RNA out. So these blocking antibodies that are produced in your lymph nodes by B cells, they can block virus infection in many ways. And this is why an adaptive response can be good. These antibodies can reduce the infection once it's started and then help you to recover. Now, um, where do these antibodies bind on the virus particle? It depends on the virus. On the left is a icosahedral virus capsid. This is a rhinovirus. And in white are all the different epitopes on the capsid where antibodies bind. Now, an epitope, of course, is a very short amino acid sequence that's recognized by an antibody molecule. And so these can be mapped on viruses in a variety of ways. So you can see antibodies bind in a lot of different places. And depending on where the antibodies are binding, they can block uptake, they can block binding, they can block uncoding, and so forth. How about on an envelope virus that has glycoproteins in its envelope? So that's on the right. This is the hemagglutinin glycoprotein of influenza virus. So when you get a flu vaccine or when you get the flu in reality, most of the antibodies that you make are directed against the head of this hemagglutinin molecule. It's what we call an immunodominant protein. There are antibodies made to other parts, and we will talk about those later because they turn out to be really, really important. But most of them are made to the globular head, and they bind to it very well, and they either prevent attachment of the virus or uncoating uh, in the end endosome. And those epitopes for binding are shown here in green and red. And uh, you can see them in this view. This is a top view of the molecule. We're looking down on these molecules now, uh, and these are the binding sites in dark colors. Now, influenza virus has the very interesting property of changing to evade antibody binding. So from year to year, you get single amino acid changes in the globular head of the hemagglutinin. Just because the virus is, is, is uh, mutation prone and makes a lot of mistakes. And these can block the antibodies from binding. And what I'm showing here is the changes that occurred from 1918 in the H1N1 virus, this is the H1 hemagglutinin, to 2009 when a related virus reemerged and caused a pandemic. You can see there were quite a few changes in the intervening time. So uh, this is why we have to make a new vaccine every few years, because the HA head has changed enough so that the antibodies you have made in response to the vaccination are not binding well anymore and they're not neutralizing it. And this is uh, one of a number of viruses that can do this, but it's the one that bugs us every year. So we it's a continuing problem. Now the other coin, the other side of the coin of adaptive immunity is the cytotoxic T cell, cell mediated immunity. And as I said, cytotoxic T cells are what you need to clear most virus uh, infection. And these are what we call the Th1 response. Uh, the cytotoxic T cell recognizes the virus infected cell because these cells show on their surfaces Viral peptides, that's the little orange box there, they're presented by MHC molecules. And the CTL says, yes, this is a self molecule and it has a foreign peptide in it, I'm going to kill it. It makes a synapse and the CTL transfers lytic proteins to the uh, cell, the infected cell in the form of perforin and granzymes, can also induce apoptosis 
the, the, uh, l the attachment of the CTL to the infected cell engages certain receptors which induce apoptosis. The result is that uh, this cell is killed. I think you can see that that has two effects. It, the killing of the cell limits the spread of infection, but it can also cause pathology. And we'll see later how by limiting CTL killing, you can actually reduce the symptoms of a virus infection. <clears throat> now here's an experiment where we explore what's important for protecting monkeys against monkeypox virus infection. And so what we have here is we are infecting animals um, with monkeypox. So first they're infected and uh, these animals um, you're given a low dose of monkeypox virus. This group of animals makes a high titer antibody by day 22. So these are just uh, new, these are just the inverse of dilutions that are used to measure antibody titer. So this is a good antibody response. And then you infect uh, these animals with a high titer of virus, and then you look sometime after to see who's living. So we have four monkeys here, and none of them died. So they were protected uh, by this good antibody titer. Uh, now you do the same experiment, except that you deplete these monkeys for B cells. You can do that using antibodies. You, you deplete the uh, B cells from their blood at various times, minus 8, minus 1, day 7, and day 15. Now you can see, because you've taken away their B cells, they're not making good antibody titers. And then when you challenge them with high titers of monkeypox, 3 out of 4 die. So this tells you that antibodies are important for protection. Now if you deplete CD8 cells, you do the same thing, use antibodies to reduce the CD8 cells. These are the ones that are going to give rise to cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Uh, you get a good antibody titer, uh, and then you challenge, and these, these monkeys are fine. So they're protected by the antibodies. They don't care about CTLs. So that's an example of an infection where CTLs don't matter uh, for protection. For some infections, though, the CTL response is more important. I haven't shown you an example of that. Um, and CTLs will prevent infection. So how do you regulate where the response is going? How do you regulate whether an infection makes antibodies or CTLs? Well, that happens in the lymph node where the dendritic cells come in and present antigens to the B and the T cells. Uh, and these are, this decision is made by helper T cells. And these helper T cells contact uh, the dendritic cells in the lymph node and they have a little exchange of information. The dendritic cells gives information to the TH cells. The TH cells make uh, cytokines. And then based on that interaction, uh, the TH cells become either TH1 or TH2 cells. And that really depends, that will in affect whether you make antibodies. So TH2 cells uh, will make, uh, stimulate B cell differentiation. And TH1 cells will stimulate CTLs. So again, how these CD4s differentiate based on their initial interaction with the DC biases it one way or another. And so some viral infections go Th1 and some go Th2. So Th1 cells make killer T cells, and this is good for clearing many virus infections. Th2 cells make cytokines that activate B cells, and this is typically good for other infections, but not typically for viral infections, although there are some where that's a good idea. And again, the balance between Th1 and Th2 is determined by the mix of cytokines produced by the DCs when they interact with those uh, CD4 cells. Now, these responses provide memory. Uh, if, you are, if you make a nice adaptive response to a pathogen, you have memory, you have B cell memory, and you have T cell memory. So the next time you get infected, it doesn't take weeks to make a adaptive response. It can happen in days and the response will be much greater. So the idea is on subsequent infection, um, you will make a protective response. You'll make antibodies very quickly and that will protect you against infection. That's only typical of adaptive responses. Innate responses don't have memory. And of course, this is the basis of vaccination, which we're gonna talk about later. Now, one last thing, bacteria appear to have immune systems also. And this is the CRISPR-Cas system of bacteria. It's found in about 70% of the bacteria that have been studied. And this is sort of like 
uh, small RNA interference. So these bacteria have a gene which encodes a series of cassettes. And these are memories of previous viral infections or foreign DNAs that have come into the bacteria. So for example, if this bacteria gets infected with a phage, its genome is chopped up and part of its genome is inserted into the bacterial genome. And then downstream of this cassette is a series of what are called cast genes. So what happens is when you get reinfected or when the bacteria gets reinfected by one of these viruses or if one of these plasmid DNAs come in, uh, these, are, these cassettes are, are transcribed. They're processed into little hairpin RNAs. And together with the Cas protein, they will detect the invading phage or plasmid DNA and cause it to be chopped, to be cleaved endonucleolytically. And then the infection is blocked. So bacteria get infected by phages all the time, and this is one way of stopping it. And it's got memory because the memory of this infection has persisted from a previous encounter. So the bacteria have lots and lots of these genes that are sort of records of previous infections if they've survived, of course. And those can be used to guide uh, interference with a new infection. So this is very much like interfering RNA, where we have small RNAs that are made that are complementary to genes and together with a nuclease uh, break up the mRNA. In this case, it's an immune system uh, of bacteria.